Hi, good evening. Good to be here together again. And uh, we're here to look at God's word and to bring our prayers to him later together too. So that's what we're going to be doing. Um, our first song that we're going to have together, which you can sing out your hearts at home to, is Amazing Grace. Uh, our John Newton's hymn, uh, very often we don't sing all the, the verses to that, that he wrote a lot more than they they uh, popularly put in hymn books. Uh, I'm not sure how many of them are actually in this version, but they do put in a kind of a, a middle bit to the song as well. That's um, quite stirring as it goes. So this is our first song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the 
Uh, mm. It's just so great to uh, see the church from all over the world. And uh, they say, oh, church, where are you? And we're in our little corner here, but um, the church is all over the place. And um, maybe it's brought home to you a bit more as you watch a video when you see the 101 different hairstyles, because uh, that's all part of it as well, isn't it? So let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you're calling all kinds of people from all four corners of the globe to um, to worship you and to lift up your name, uh, even tonight. Father, we thank you for the amazing grace that uh, deals with us in a way that we don't deserve. And Lord, that you deal with us in unexpected ways. Lord, that we don't even understand before we come to know you. We don't really know what it is that we're actually getting into. And uh, we don't really appreciate the, the wideness, the broadness of your love until we know it for ourselves. So, Father, we want to thank you. Um, thank you too, Lord, that uh, we can have an assurance that we are yours. And to sing boldly, as John Newton wrote, when we've been there a thousand years, bright shining as the sun, with no less days to sing your praise than when we first begun. Uh, Lord, we have a, an eternal hope before us. We praise you, our God, uh, that that starts when we first know you and uh, it goes on forever. So Lord, we thank you for that. And we ask you, our God, that you should be with us uh, this evening. Thank you for good news that uh, we've received today. Someone home from hospital. Um, Lord, uh, another uh, other news of someone having their operation today uh, in the church. And Lord, we just pray for these people and pray for ourselves, Lord, as we're here together. We ask, Lord, that we might know fellowship uh, as we share in the things of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, uh, we're going to have our reading from God's Word, and uh, tonight we're going to be in Philippians. And um, you know, I feel a little bit like that uh, old talent show. Um, and tonight, Matthew, I'm going to be such and such, because our Bible studies recently have been all over the place, haven't they? Sort of uh, going to different places. Well, Philippians 4, 1 to 9 tonight, and uh, as you can see, it's on the screen for you to read if you want to. Okay, Philippians 4, 1 to 9. Therefore, after all that's come before it, therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with you, Odia, and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Well, we're grateful again to the Lord for his word. And uh, we're going to be thinking of that tonight, um, especially uh, that reading. We're going to be looking at verses uh, six and seven, uh, which begin, do not be anxious about anything. And uh, I wanted to know a bit more about um, kind of the official thought on anxiety. So uh, I checked out... Uh, rethinkmentalillness.com and uh, we're going to have a slide and uh, this tells you a little bit about anxiety 
and uh, sort of uh, signs of anxiety. Um, racing thoughts. If your thoughts race, do you know, I had that on there and now it's just disappeared. Which is no good because I can't read it to you if I don't have it. Okay, Christine's going to show me hers. All right, okay. <laughs> Um, mental symptoms of anxiety can include racing thoughts. You just say, I just can't stop. You think of one thing after another, after another. Uncontrollable overthinking, sort of planning, planning ahead for things that may never happen anyway. Difficulties concentrating, feelings of dread or panic or impending doom, feeling irritable. I'm sure that affects nobody who's actually listening tonight, feeling irritable. Heightened alertness, problems with sleep, changes in appetite, wanting to escape from the situation you're in, and disassociation, which is explained underneath. If you disassociate, you may feel like that you're not connected to your own body, or like you're watching things happen around you without actually feeling it, without feeling as though you're involved yourself. Um, that's a kind of a weird feeling to have, isn't it? Okay, so that's um, that's a kind of a scientific sort of explanation as to anxiety. And that's that's what we're talking about here uh, in um, Philippians four and verse verse six, where he begins, "Do not be anxious about anything." Uh, and if you recognise any of those symptoms in yourself, then you know you're going to be concerned, aren't you? Here are Paul's words: "Do not be." anxious about anything maybe you've seen a cartoon or maybe you've seen a film uh, starring superman criminals shoot guns at superman and bullets bounce off and this is the command from paul here just let all the worry bounce off all the anxiety fear bounce off you like Superman. Somebody fires it at you, but no, it just bounces off like bullets off the chest of Superman. Do not be anxious about anything. Should Paul have told us to fly or lift cars, it might have been just as easy. But he didn't just give a command in the passage here. He backed up the command with the inspired words of God. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at tonight. Let's have a look and see what he says. First of all, about this command that he gave. Do not be anxious about anything. Whether it's uh, standing by the gospel, um, maybe beginning a new work for the Lord and uh, starting over because uh, as a church, you know, we're having to kind of restart again, aren't we, after this big lockdown? Or um, thinking about your own well-being, your health, mental health, physical health. Uh, personal situation, whatever. Um, Paul has something to say about anxiety in different contexts. He has something to say about all of those. Uh, the authorised version, instead of the NIV that I've got here, the authorised King James version of 1611 says that we should be careful for nothing. He says, be careful for nothing. Instead of do not be anxious, be careful for nothing. And uh, it's kind of helpful in its old English um, way of putting it, meaning be careful for nothing. Do not be full of care for anything. Do not be full of care for anything. Don't be filled up with care for any particular subject. Well, Paul, in this letter to the Philippians, he talks about various things. And uh, the first thing he mentions is in chapter one, verses 27 and 28. He wants his readers not to be intimidated by those who oppose their faith. That's the first thing to say. And uh, that's relevant to us today because we might feel that the recent cultural changes in our society have all been in a downward spiral further away from the Lord. And we need to, if we're going to apply the words of Paul to ourselves, we need to avoid sinking into anxiety about the spiritual battle that has always existed. Paul tells his readers not to fear about that. 
chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. Amazing, isn't it? How Paul can say something all those years ago and it turned out to be exactly what we need to hear today. If there's any intimidation about this old world and the way it's going, well, don't be frightened in any way by those who oppose you. As churches start to regather themselves after the lockdown, some are going to be concerned as to what church is actually going to even look like. How will we worship in the future? Well, Philippi was the first church that Paul started in Eastern Europe. Um, this was a leap for him and for the gospel into a different culture and a challenge for most people to adapt. But Paul wasn't concerned about how things were going to go. He wasn't bothered about uh, a new start. He wasn't troubled about a new culture. In chapter one again, verses four to six, he says, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The Lord starts a work, the Lord's going to carry that work on. If the Lord begins that work in you, he's going to bring it on to completion. And sometimes, you know, we might even fight against it, but that's what happens. The Lord works in us, he carries on working in us. He doesn't forget us, even if we try and forget him. That's just the way it is. He carries on in us. So there's different things Paul is saying. Yeah, these things might be of anxiety to you, but don't be anxious. And, well, Paul talks about himself. And he talks about how he's quite accepting of all outcomes that can turn out for himself. In chapter 4, verse 12, he says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. He can't think of anything that is actually going to be more disturbing to him than the peace that he actually has in Christ. And when he's reflecting on suffering a possible death at the hands of the Romans, or maybe release from prison, Paul sees the alternatives purely in relation to Jesus. In chapter 1, verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm going to hang around, then I'm going to live for the Lord Jesus. But if I die, then that's great for me personally, because I get to be with him and I don't have to go through any more of this suffering. So he's got it all worked out. He's happy, whatever happens. How did Paul manage to have such a state of mind? when there was so much for him to be anxious about. We can't kid ourselves and say that in our crazy upside down world today, it's worse for us than it was for Paul. We can't honestly get ourselves to believe that we have more to go through than the apostle to the Gentiles, because that's just not true. Anxiety is something we experience in relation to loss. Anxiety and loss go together, or the idea of loss. It's all about loss, really. Although what might be lost could vary enormously, and you might not be thinking it in those terms, it is actually what we're concerned about in anxiety. We worry about our health because we're scared that we might lose our health, we might lose our ability to take care of ourselves, might lose our ability to do this, that and the other. Or actually, we might lose our lives because we're concerned about health. 
we worry about our job because we might lose our job we might lose our income we might lose our self-respect we might lose this that and the other we're worried about our happiness well i feel quite happy today but i'm not sure that i'm going to be happy tomorrow well i might lose my happiness and i might lose those things that go along with happiness the achievement of goals am i going to be able to do all those things i've got so many things to do and so you feel as though i'm missing out on an opportunity i'm missing out on a responsibility i feel i have i'm missing out on this that and the other i'm going to lose the battle that i feel that my life has become i'm scared that i lose my friends i'm scared that i might lose money i'm scared that i might lose reputation i might lose my life the list just goes on and on and there's 101 things as you can see in the life of paul that he could have been anxious about and that we could be anxious about but paul quite unreasonably tells us not to be anxious about anything nothing be anxious for nothing well you know it's great when we get a, a command from the lord because you know that's we know what we've got to do then but when you've got a command from the lord that uh, really seems to be shooting for the moon and it's just pretty much impossible you kind of think to yourself how's this going to work how does that go well helpfully for us in philippians we're given a command not to do something tied in with a command to do something and you can look at it as don't do that but instead of that do this it's a replacement instead of that do this instead because this is a better way to go than that otherwise we might have just been left hanging in the air do this impossible thing but no it's not just the impossible thing it's do this instead of that and we're told in the verse but instead of that but in every situation everyone by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to god instead of being anxious bring your prayers and petition by prayer and petition with thanksgiving bring your requests to god all right we should see straight away that there is no time for which this verse is inappropriate as you look at it it strikes you immediately that's the first thing in every situation paul says and for him that covered threats to his life um, the well-being of the church and facing poverty or plenty and we've seen all that already just in the letter that he wrote to the philippians but you might be a scholar and know a bit more about the acts of the apostles and hear about all the beatings that he received and the stoning and the uh, shipwrecking uh, and everything else that went on even getting bitten on the hand by a snake all of this stuff <laughs> in every situation you bring your prayers to the lord well we sometimes feel as though oh, it's okay for other people but i've got extenuating circumstances extenuating circumstances i've got a loophole i've got a footnote at the bottom of my contract which says okay normally but not now yeah i know that the lord says this but something's just happened so it doesn't really apply to me to where i am now but without exception this is what we need to do paul makes it pretty clear here present your request to god in every situation at a prayer meeting present your request to god you know you might think that that's a, a pretty obvious time to present your request to god well, it's a great opportunity that we have in a prayer meeting. Present your requests to God. At home, present your requests to God. If you're alone or with your loved one, present your requests to God. If you're feeling happy or you're feeling desperately sad, 
and lonely and washed out, present your requests to God. When you were a child, take yourself back all those dim and distant years. And I've seen the films. I know that some of you were around when it was black and white because I've seen the films and they were black and white. Well, in those days, dim and distant days, bouncing along, you maybe wrote a letter to Santa. And when you wrote to Santa, I don't know, I guess people have always done this. You're asking for a new bike, maybe a new doll or something. And your hope that Santa was going to answer your letter positively was based on the claim, which might well have been fraudulent, that you had been a good boy or a good girl that year. Dear Santa, I've been a very good boy. Could I have a new bike? Thanks very much. Santa might deliver the goods because you persuaded him or because he just does that kind of a thing. But you don't spend a lot of time writing thank you letters to Santa, do you? You don't spend an awful lot of time praising up Santa as being the best person ever. Why would the Lord hear your prayers? Why would he listen when you pray to him? On what basis would he grant your requests? Can't really hope to persuade him that you've been good enough. You know, the Santa Claus approach doesn't really work with God. Uh, not when uh, Isaiah 64 verse 6 stands witness against us. All of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Yeah, it's a tough call, isn't it, to plead your own righteousness before God. So what we're left with when we pray to God is his grace. And you know, grace means unmerited favour. That's the whole idea about grace is that you don't deserve any of it, that he gives you what you really don't deserve to have. It's unmerited. You can't win it. You can't earn it. You can't be good enough for it. It just happens because God gives and he gives again because he loves us. All right. Unmerited favor. So as we bring our prayers to him, we are told to come with thanksgiving. Did you notice that? Uh, do not be anxious about everything, anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So if we can't thank God for something, we can't see anything to thank God for, we're a little bit like those lepers, the nine out of the 10 lepers that got healed and who never managed to actually acknowledge the kindness of Jesus. That's not a great position to be in, is it? If the Lord's done something for you, you've got to be a thankful person. And if you're in the position, well, let's say prayers of thanksgiving and nothing comes out. That's not a wholly great sign from us, is it? Bring your prayers to him by all means. Don't dwell in the walled city of anxiety because it has very broad walls and very deep walls and it's very difficult to get out of. Don't live in the walled city of anxiety, which is located very, very closely to Doubting Castle. But when you bring your prayers, I guess that bringing them with thanksgiving is really saying, bring your prayers and remember who you're praying to. Because when you remember him, you will see the appropriateness of thanksgiving. Jesus wept when she saw, sorry, Mary wept when she saw Jesus at the tomb. The old man, Simeon, 
was pleased to see the baby Jesus in the temple at Jerusalem because they both knew who this was. Mary wept when she saw Jesus. The old man Simeon was pleased because they both knew that this was the Messiah. We can't think of the Lord truly without some measure of gratitude. If we're thinking of Jesus and we're not thinking in some way with gratitude, we're not really thinking about the Jesus of the Bible. To bring prayers without any gratitude at all suggests Almighty God has turned into Santa in our thinking. You bring your prayer, you bring your requests, and you bring your hopeful note to Santa without any kind of gratitude, without any kind of relationship with the funny old man in the red suit. You can't bring prayers to the Lord in that same way. Because you're not really bringing prayers to the Lord. Bring prayers to him and petitions with thanksgiving, knowing who he is, remembering who he is. God was very keen that Moses should know his name at the burning bush. Tell them, I am that I am is sending you. He didn't want any confusion as he addressed the patriarchs either. In Genesis 26, that night the Lord appeared to him, Isaac, and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I want you to know I am the God that your dad was always speaking about. And in Genesis 28, 13, there beside him stood the Lord and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. This is where he's talking to Jacob. And he wants Jacob to know, I am the God of Abraham, your granddad. I'm the God of Isaac, your father. I am your God. God is very keen that we know who he is. That's why he's given us over a thousand pages to tell us. He wants us to know him. He comes to us. He sends his son to us. He comes so that we get to know him. And so when we pray, we're praying to the one that we know rather than just that guy who answers prayers. We need to know to whom we speak because it gives us reverence for him. It gives us understanding of who he is and why he's going to answer. But also it does give us that gratitude that we've been talking about. How can we know the Lord and not be grateful? We owe all we are and all we have to him. We owe him forgiveness and we owe him freedom uh, from the stain and the power of sin. He gives us that. Instead of being anxious, we should be praying with thanksgiving. We're given a promise of what will happen. And that's what comes next in the passage. It says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What he's, what he's saying is, know God in increasing measure and you'll know his peace. As you bring your prayers to him with thanksgiving, as you develop in your understanding, as you grow in your knowledge and in your familiarity with him, what will happen is you'll become much more peaceful as a person. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We've got more than one duvet. We've got a, a winter duvet. We've got a summer duvet. And my wife's here. She's probably cringing now, thinking, yeah, we've got another six ones as well. But I don't know. All I know about is the winter one and the summer one. And all I'm going to tell you about is that winter one, because the winter duvet is really soft. I think it's brushed cotton or something. And I know that winter duvet. And that winter duvet is soft. I'm sitting in our lounge at the moment, and I know, because it's getting a little bit not quite so light, 
it's not pitch black by any means, but all day really, because it's at the back of the house, I know our lounge could do with a bit more sun. We're not gonna knock a wall through because it won't help because the sun's from over there instead of being from over there. So um, I know these things. I know about the duvet cover. I know about the lounge. I know about the duvet cover because I've spent many a happy hour underneath it, although most of it's been asleep. Um, I know about, it's a little bit dark in our lounge because I've been here long enough um, working on Bible studies. And um, yeah, I know because I've been there and I know the Lord will bless you with his peace because I've spent time with him and he blesses me with peace. You bring yourself to him and the more honest you are and the more open you are, the greater the answer is going to be. And you can pray silently or you can pray using words or even producing the noise of the words. But if you pray silently, you're actually, what you're doing is you're praying your thoughts, you're thinking a prayer to God, aren't you? You're thinking, nobody else can hear, you're thinking those words uh, to God. And if you pray just by thinking, then of course, we're, what we're saying is, the Lord hears your thoughts. And if the Lord hears those words that you're directing at him, he hears all the words that you're not directing at him as well. So you could look at it in another way, that actually your life is kind of like a life of prayer. And you're praying intentionally good things to God. And sometimes the things that you're thinking are not so great. The greater blessing for us is when we direct our thoughts intentionally towards him in prayer. And it's a blessing to us to do that because it confirms our relationship and his relationship with us. So I know that he knew I needed that car parking space, but I'm confirming my relationship to him when I pray to him about it. Lord, I could really do with the space here. Help me out because there isn't anywhere to park. So you, it's confirming your relationship. And it's like talking to your friend instead of just thinking about them. I can think of someone who's dear to me and not say a word to them. And it makes me feel good because I'm thinking about them. But actually when I communicate directly, intentionally with them, then that confirms the relationship. God hears your thoughts, but it's better than just thinking. It's better to direct your thoughts to him. Bring your prayers to the Lord when you feel that there's something that you need to share with him. Like when you wake up, the first thing you can do is thank him for your sleep. Because a lot of people struggle to sleep. And if you manage to sleep, that's good for you. And that's a good thing to thank God for. When you get up out of bed or the chair or wherever, thank him for the strength that you have to rise from your bed. Because for some, it's not so easy to get up. And if you can do it, that's great. Thank the Lord for that. Bring your day to him and the things that you've got to do today and talk to him about them and say, oh, I don't really know how I'm gonna do that or what am I gonna do about that? Show me the way to do that. Uh, bring your loved ones to him. And here's a really good thing to do. Bring to him the people that you don't really like. Pray for the people that you don't like, because over a period of time, if you keep on praying for Mr. Smith down the road, um, you might start off not liking him, uh, but after a while, you're going to be looking out for the answers to your prayers. And if you've been praying good things for him, you're going to be looking for good things to be happening to him. What you'll find in the scriptures about Jesus will give you confidence in him. He said in John 16, in this world, you will have trouble. He said that. But take heart, I have overcome the world. 
Who ever could say that? Who could say, I've overcome the world, meaning I've overcome the powers of the world, the force uh, or the forces that they stand behind. The world invests itself in capitalism or communism or materialism. The world invests itself in the gathering, the amassing of wisdom or knowledge. The world invests itself in that and that. And Jesus says, I've overcome all of those things. I've overcome the idea of temptation. I've overcome wrongdoing. There isn't anything, a power, a force in the world that I have not overcome. He overcame the worst the world had to offer him at Calvary. And there is no temptation that he can't help you with. There is no hardship that he can't help you with. No problem, then, no person that he can't help you with when you come to him. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Here's a great psalm. This is maybe maybe do a Bible study on this one. This is Psalm 46, 1 to 3. I read this um, a few weeks ago. Psalm 46, 1 to 3. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. That's a little bit over the top, you know, may I say, when we're thinking of catastrophe, when we're thinking of worst case scenario. God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though... It's an apocalypse, basically. The earth gives way. The mountains fall into the heart of the sea. The, the sea's waters roar and foam. The mountains quake with their surging. Well, you know, having a dodgy next door neighbour is not quite that, is it? Having job problems isn't the same as that. Having worries about this, that or the other. It's not quite the apocalypse. God is our refuge and strengths he is an ever-present help in trouble therefore we will not fear even though all that stuff could happen even though that stuff that's far worse than is going to happen you'll have to pay attention to the last part of the text tonight do not be anxious about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving Present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Our hearts and our minds are private in a sense. Nobody else sees inside my mind, inside my heart, like the private parts of your body. You need to protect them. And you need to keep them safe. This is yours. This is private to you. You don't use them casually. You need to guard your heart and your mind. You've got to be careful what you let in there and careful what you let stay in there. Some things are going to hurt you. If you're not sure about something, bring it to the Lord and see what he thinks. But this is the kind of the promise that comes after the command and the replacement, the command, uh, do not be anxious about anything. The replacement, but instead of that, in every situation, bring your request to God. And the promise is, and when you do that, when you bring your request to God, the peace of God will keep you. Jesus said this, Matthew 28, 20 teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Draw comfort from that and give him your problems and you will see his blessing in your life. We're going to have prayer in a few minutes, but first of all, we're going to have our next song. When peace like a river, it is well with my soul. A river attended my way when sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever followed, thou hast taught me to say. Yeah. 
That had a sudden ending, didn't it?